We've been talking about love this month, uh, and uh, we're not talking about love just for the sake of learning more about love. More importantly, we've been talking about love to kind of explore how we action this in our lives. How do we live out love as the people of God in a very hurt and broken world? Now, I don't know about you this morning, but I think that the concept of love should be immediate, immediately associated with the word Christian. That word love and the word Christian, I think, should go together, right? I, I believe that Christians should be defined by their love for others. But you know, the sad truth is that when a lot of people hear the word Christian, it doesn't immediately trigger the concept of love for them. Mostly, people think of other adjectives when they think of that word Christian. You know, I did a quick uh, search online, as you do, uh, just to kind of see if anybody had asked this question. What do people think when they hear the word Christian? And there is a bunch of stuff uh, on the interweb, right? There's so many results on Google and Yahoo and YouTube. And, and these are some of the words that, that people, kind of the first words that came to mind when they, when they heard the word Christian. Hypocrites. Self-righteous, judging. People think that Christians are boring. Are you boring? They think that Christians are loud or strict or arrogant or rigid. People, when they think of the word Christian, they think of Christians as being bigoted or biased or Bible-thumping. Some people think of Christians as being crooks, liars, prejudiced. And those lists go on. You can go on the internet and have a look yourself. There's, there's so much there. Now, you might be sitting in your seat this morning and you might think, well, that doesn't really bother me. But here's the thing, here's the thing. In the kingdom of God, the single highest value way above any other value is the value of love. It's the value of love. In fact, when Jesus summarized the entire message of the Bible, he said, we've got to love God and we've got to love people. That's what he said. You know, the greatest chapter in the Bible um, about love is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13 speaks about the supremacy of love. And the Apostle Paul says that there are three things that are really, really important. Paul says in that chapter, he says there are three big things. He says, firstly, there's faith. He says, faith is really important. It's impossible to please God without faith. He says, your salvation depends on it. So Paul says, faith is really big. And then Paul goes on and he says there's hope. He says hope is really big. You can't survive the valleys and the difficulties in life without hope. So Paul says hope is really big. There's faith and there's hope. And then Paul says there's love. Love is the most important of them all. He says the greatest of these three, the greatest of these three, the apostle Paul tells us, is love. I don't know what it is with you people. You always give me a dry mouth. I want to read the first three verses of that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. No, I love you. I do love you. Have I told you that this morning? I love you. I don't know if you love me, but I love you. We're talking about love this morning. So, 1 Corinthians 13, these are the first three verses. The Apostle Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but if I have no love, he says, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Paul says, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all the mysteries uh, that there are and all of the knowledge, and he says, if I have faith that can move mountains, but if I don't have love, Paul says, I am nothing. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, Paul says, I gain nothing. Now, I don't know how many times you might have read those words, but I think when you stop to think about those words, when you stop to think and really consider those words, to really Understand what Paul's saying over there. Something's got to change in your brain. Something's got to change in your mind. It's, it's sobering. See, if I have the talent to come and stand before you, a crowd of people, and keep you engaged for 30 minutes, if I was a super clever guy and the only reason why you came out today was because you wanted to hear my wisdom and you wanted to just see my sheer brilliance on display, if I was committed to all of the right causes and advanced those causes with great self-sacrifice, but if I fail to live and to walk and to talk and to work and to worship with a loving heart, you know what I'd be? I'd be a, just another life that's missed the mark. Just another life that's missed the mark. And so, folk, I want to just remind you this morning, what we're talking about is big. This is big. This whole idea of living out love as followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, we've got to be clear on this. 
And so what I want to do is I want to throw out a couple of thoughts just to get us thinking about how big this really is. And to begin with, we've got to go to Jesus, right? I had one year. We've got to go to Jesus, right? Can you give me an amen? Can we just get a little bit Pentecostal in this place this morning? We've got to go to Jesus, right? Because when we look at how Jesus lived and how Jesus loved, we begin to learn something about God. And in turn, we learn about how we have been designed to live and to love. And so I want to go to a chapter in the Bible this morning. I want to go to Luke chapter 7, uh, and uh, it's, it's, there's some stories in there that we're going to look at. The, the Bible records in Luke chapter 7 right after the Sermon on the Mount. You've all heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah. This amazing talk that Jesus gave, this, this really world-changing talk where he, uh, he astonished people. People were amazed by the speaking ability that Jesus had, the sheer brilliance and, and the power of his insights. People were going, who is this man? And so in Luke chapter seven, right after Jesus has given this amazing talk, this world-changing talk, Luke tells us that Jesus, straight after this moment, goes back into his normal itinerant ministry. And Luke tells us about three interactions that Jesus had with some people. And so what I wanna do is I want us to look at these interactions and then I'm gonna try and tie this all together at the end of the message this morning. And so I'm not gonna go through all of the stories on screen. We won't have all the verses up there, but if you've got a Bible, you can pull that out. Go to Luke chapter seven, fire it up on your phone. You can read and I'm gonna talk, okay, deal? Hallelujah, we're gonna get a little alive in this place this morning. I'll tell you why we need to be alive, because Jesus is the life giver, yeah? And so when we come into a space, we don't come just to say, well, entertain me. This is not a Robbie Williams concert, right? We come into this space so that we can say, God, help me, help me learn, help me grow, help me be the kind of community that you want me to be. Help me be part of the light that needs to shine into a very dark world. Are you with me? Luke chapter seven. The first person that Jesus meets is a Roman soldier. And this Roman soldier has a sick servant. Now you've got to remember that the Romans were an occupying force in Judea at, those, at that time. Um, the, the, the Romans, the Roman occupying soldiers were not well-loved people. The Jewish people did not have a high regard for them. They didn't want them in the land. But this Roman soldier comes, uh, he sends some people to Jesus and he, has a, he is a servant, he, probably a servant boy. And uh, I don't know, he has a special relationship with the servant, but he's a servant. The servant guy probably has to polish the soldier's uh, sandals, keep the villa clean, I don't know. Shove up the horse, shovel up the horse manure, you know, servant kind of stuff. And so this Roman soldier wants to bother Jesus because his servant boy has gotten quite sick. Now just think about this for a moment. Jesus has given this amazing talk in many people's minds, and there were a whole lot of people following Jesus. In, in many people's minds, Jesus was a big deal. His talk has astonished thousands of people. They're looking at Jesus and they're and they, and they, and they, they blown away, right? He's, he's a bit of a celebrity. He's a, he's a VIP. Jesus has given this amazing talk. Why would he take the time to get involved with this servant boy's problem? Why? Let's bring this to our own lives. I want you to think about this in your own life this morning. What do you do? What do you do? Tell me, what do you do when you are busy with life and a friend of a friend comes along and wants you to go out of your way for them, right? Or that person at church that you don't know so well introduces you to a new immigrant to Australia and that person, he or she needs to talk to you about helping them find a job. Or your brother-in-law, who is your brother-in-law and you kind of like, well, he's my brother and he doesn't really have a relationship, but brother-in-law, been out of work for a while and uh, is struggling to make his mortgage payment. What do you do? Or your neighbor needs help cutting her grass, but you've never operated a lawnmower because you've got a gardening service and, and, and she wants you to help her. What do you do with this kind of stuff in life? Let me ask you this morning, what would Jesus do? Wow. What would Jesus do? Wow. He's just given this amazing talk and he gets approached by this, this Roman soldier with a ser servant boy who's not well. Let's go back to Luke chapter seven. Jesus bumps into another person. He's on, a, on the move again and he's on his way to a little town called Nain. And Jesus has obviously got something planned. He's got to get there, right? But, uh, something that he's got to be at. But Jesus gets interrupted by a funeral procession. Let me ask you this morning, what do you do when you're going somewhere 
especially if you're like a semi-important person, what do you do when you go to be someplace, you're going somewhere and you get delayed? There's a spanner that's thrown into your plans. What do you do? Right, you're, you're rushing to work for an important meeting. You've gotta be there. You know, there are people that are gonna be there meeting you. They're waiting on you, but your neighbor comes along and urgently needs to get to a doctor's appointment, but their car has a problem. The battery's given up the ghost. And all of a sudden, as you're about to get out of your house, get into your car and get to that meeting, the neighbor is knocking on the front door and they wanna know if you can help them get to the doctor's appointment. That exact thing happened to me just a couple of months ago. That's why I'm using it as an illustration, what would you do? See, Jesus is en route. He's gotta be someplace, he's going somewhere, and now this funeral procession stops him. And he sees this widow walking behind a casket, and there are lots of friends, and, and they're driving really slowly with their headlights on, and, and Jesus can't get through. What do you do? What do you do when something as precious as your time is threatened? When something as precious as your time is jeopardized, what do you do when someone makes you Wait, when someone is late for an appointment, when the traffic at nine o'clock is way slower than you thought it should be, what do you do? Let me ask you this morning, what happens to your heart? The third little interaction uh, that happens in Luke chapter seven is, is with a Pharisee. And this Pharisee invites Jesus to his home. And um, when I read the story, I, I, I think that the, the, uh, the Pharisee actually wants to get into a bit of a debate with Jesus. I think he wants to get into a theological discussion with Jesus, and I think he's, he's, he's hoping to try and discredit Jesus in some way. And so he invites Jesus. The invitation goes out, Jesus accepts, and, and the dinner begins. And the guests uh, have all arrived, and they're looking forward to how this, this evening is gonna go. I think the guests that arrived are probably like, yeah, let's hear what this, what's gonna happen in this discussion that's about to start between you know, this, this Pharisee here and, and Jesus, this, this rabbi. Just picture the moment because here they are, all these guests, and then in walks this woman. She walks into the home and everybody knows that she is the local sex worker. And she comes in and she sits down at the feet of Jesus and she bursts into tears. It's a, just imagine, it's a potentially embarrassing moment, right? What if people were thinking, you know, does she know Jesus? Is she an acquaintance? Is, what's the deal? Has Jesus been a customer? She's not going away. She's hanging around by the feet of Jesus. And now she's reaching for a perfume bottle. Who, know, what's she gonna do? Who knows what she's gonna do with the perfume bottle? Can you picture the scene this morning? There's no smooth way out of a situation like that. You've, you've just got to kind of engage in the moment and you've got to start a conversation and see what's going on. And that's exactly what Jesus did. That's, this is what was happening to Jesus. This woman has got a hold of his feet. She's right there. The crowd is in the room and she's not going everybody, anywhere. Everybody is looking to see what's going on. What do you think Jesus does? Let me ask you this morning, what do you do when awkward, needy people, people who may be an embarrassment to you, what do you do when those kinds of people break into your carefully protected little life? What do you do when you're caught off guard and you can't just turn away, you can't just walk away from that person? What do you do when you are confronted with people who are in need and you can't get out of it? Well, there you have it. Three little interactions that happened straight after this amazing, astonishing talk that Jesus gave on the hillside next to the Sea of Galilee. Now, there are a couple of things that stand out for me here this morning, and I wanna bring them out. I want us to think about these things. The first thing that I think that is really striking, certainly for me, is, is, is that Jesus, <laughs> there's this huge public moment that he's just come out of. I mean, it's, it's, Jesus is giving this amazing talk. Uh, Jesus is who everyone has come to watch and to listen to. He's had this amazing public moment. Jesus is the main attraction. The spotlight is on him, right? Everybody's standing in awe of Jesus. I can, I can imagine security or maybe the disciples kind of holding people back. Like, just don't get too close to him, right? You know, because, of, because of this talk, he's, he's, if this was 2018, I think that, that by the end of the talk, Jesus would you know, have security come and round him up and push him away with, the, you know, with his entourage. You know, that's, that's 2018, long, but they'll be talking about a long time ago. You, you'd think... You'd think, he's important. But Jesus, 
just comes in an opposite manner, in, a, in an opposite spirit. He doesn't let the, 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 the lights that are shining on him, the spotlight on him, put him into some kind of different category. Jesus comes and still has all kinds of love and concern for the soldier who's got the sick servant boy and he heals him. He has all kinds of time and compassion for this widow whose funeral was messing up his schedule and, and, and making him late. And Jesus comes and he, he, his heart goes out to this widow and he resurrects her son and gives him back to her. He has a heart full of forgiveness for this repentant prostitute. I want you to understand this morning that this is a unique kind of love. This is a unique kind of love. All too often, our love is so limited, isn't it? It's so limited. Ask me to love my family. Ask me to love my friends, my close friends. Ask me to do that. Well, I tell you what, I could do that. I could love them quite easily. But if you come and you ask me to love people who are outside of that little circle, outside of my family and close friends, people that I don't know, I don't know where they're from, we're from nowhere, If you come and ask me to love them, then immediately what's gonna happen in my mind is there's gonna be all of these qualifiers and all of these filters. Okay, if you're asking me to love some people outside of that circle, then I I tell you, those people better be nice people. You want me to love them, then they better be people who are not gonna hurt me. You want me to love love them, they they better be safe people. They better be stable people. They better be deserving of my love. Think for a moment this morning of all of the little filters and qualifiers that we have. You want me to love those people? Because that's what we're talking about this month. You want me to love those people so often in our little life, we go, well, are they white like me? Are they black like me? You want me to love those people? Well, are they Christians? You you want me to love those people? Are they they liberals? Are they labor? You, you want me to love those people? Yeah, well, you know, are they, are they young like I'm young? You know, because that's, those are the kind of people I associate with. Are they, are, they, are they old people? I can only love old people. I mean, I can only associate with people who are my age. You know, come on, you know. Are they single like me? You know, we've got all of these qualifiers. They better be rich people if you want me to love them. Where do all these qualifiers come from? Where do all these filters come from? So often... When people don't meet our little requirements, let me tell you what happens. Our human love dries up really, really quickly. Human love is so limited. But I'll tell you this morning, God's love is not at all like that. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Jesus demonstrated the love of God. And he did not flinch when he was asked to heal the servant boy of an occupying soldier. They hated them. Jesus comes and he says, no problem. He does it with joy. Jesus just has this reckless kind of love. We sang about it this morning. It's a reckless kind of love towards poor people and and people who are maimed and and the outcast and the forgotten. He has this this love for like the riffraff of society, the rich and the poor and different races and, and different socioeconomic standings. Jesus just has this amazing love this unique love, there are no limits on his love. And you know something this morning, the more I discover about this kind of love, the more the Holy Spirit says to me, Andrew, I want you to be able to give away that kind of love. I want you to be able to give away a love that is broader and wider and less parochial and less filtered and less qualified. Andrew, I want you to be able to express love across racial boundaries. I want you to express love across socioeconomic lines and political lines and gender lines. And I'll tell you this morning, I think the Holy Spirit is saying that to me because what's the alternative? It's a limited human love. And what do we see around us so much of these days? I'll tell you what we see. We see hatred. And all it does is it breeds more hatred and contempt, breeds cruelty in a greater measure. And this is the question that I think God's asking each one of us this morning. I think God's asking you this morning, how is your love level? How is your love level? Are you in a deficit position or are you in an overflow position? 
Let me tell you, if you're in a deficit position, the only way that that's gonna change is if you open up your heart to the love of God. It's the only way it's gonna change. So often we come into this very auditorium and we sing those words. We sing them with a ba- without, without anything holding us back. I will build my life upon your love, we sing. We say it out. We say it is a firm foundation. If you're in a deficit position this morning, that's the only way you're gonna get to an overflowing point. Let me ask you, how is your level of love this morning? Let's get back to Luke chapter seven. What did Jesus do when his journey was delayed because of that funeral? You know, I can tell you when I, when I get delayed, my reflex heart reaction is like, if something messes up my plans, is I, I begin to get frustrated. I, I, I sometimes get a little bit angry and you know what happens is my heart just gets really small and really cold. That's what happens with me when my plans get messed up. Can anybody identify with me this morning? When your plans are messed up, it's like, love shuts down, right? Love shuts down. But here's Jesus with this funeral procession. He's delayed, yes, but does he get angry? No. I love the text in Luke 7, 13. It says, when the Lord saw her, this, I love these words. It says, his heart went out to her. His heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. You see, we are led to believe when we read the scripture that Jesus didn't even know who she was. He didn't know that widow. He'd never met her before. And here's this procession, it's messing up with his, his schedule, it's messing his plans up, it's making him late. But his heart of love didn't get cold, it didn't get small, it didn't shut down. Jesus was open and he was ready to love. And his, his, his heart found a way that he could relieve the suffering of that widow. And he raised her son from the dead and he gave him back to her. Let me tell you, this kind of love, it's it's a love that embraces the unexpected. It is a love that stays open despite the interruptions. It's a love that seeks to see what God's got in mind when my carefully laid out plans get messed up. I gotta stop and say, God, what have you got in mind, right? This is the kind of love that we're talking about this morning. What about that crying sex worker? What does Jesus do? You know, if it was me, if somebody walked into a staff meeting, a, a prostitute and, said, and came and sat down by my feet, I'd be like, whoa, move away. What do you, what? No, Jesus does not push her away to protect his reputation. And I'm telling you, the people around him in that room that day were going, he knows her. He, know, he knows her. How does he know her? But you know what? Jesus wasn't worried about what other people thought. And he doesn't get angry. He doesn't get angry with this, with this woman for her wrong moral choices of the past. He doesn't even give her a lecture. He doesn't give her a sermon on how to turn over a new moral leaf. You know what Jesus does? He just begins to look into her. He looks into her eyes and he sees her tears and he discerns that her repentance is real. And he quietly says to her, he says, it's over. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Your past is wiped clean. This is an amazing kind of love. This is a unique kind of love. Can you imagine for a moment just how that girl felt? Can you imagine? I think some some of us probably in this room this morning can imagine because maybe some of us remember the day that we came to Jesus in the middle of our shame. And I think that some of us, you will remember the moment that you had an encounter with the living God and there were tears flowing and your heart was, was just crushed. And maybe you came and saying, God, I don't know how you could ever forgive me for what I've done. How could you ever come and touch this life? You remember, I'm sure that this church congregation has some spectacular sin, isn't it? Lots of you can remember quite clearly. You remember that inaudible voice of Jesus where he said, I see your tears. I see your repentance. I know that it's real. And you just, you had an encounter with with God and and you know he said it's over. You're mine now. I give you salvation as a gift. I tell you, when I came to that point of understanding those words, it was on on an Alpha course over 20 years ago. And I tell you, I was not just overwhelmed by his love. I was transformed by his love. I have been transformed by his love. And I have to remind myself often to offer up that same kind of love freely to other people in and around my life when they've messed up. I have to offer up that love. I wanna be someone who can easily give grace. But that means that I have to receive God's love and then I've gotta give it. I've gotta live this love out. Now, I don't know about you this morning, but I wanna be more like the one that I claim to follow. 
I want to love Jesus. I want to love like Jesus loved, like he loved that servant boy. I want to, I want to have the time and the compassion like Jesus did for, for that widow whose funeral procession was messing up his day. I want to have a heart of forgiving grace like Jesus did toward that repentant prostitute. That's the kind of love that I want to have. How's your love level this morning? Before I finish, I just want to come back to this, this public moment that Jesus had where he's had this huge experience. The, he has the adulation of the crowd. He's, he's heard the applause of the crowd. He, the people esteem him. He's highly esteemed. He's just given this amazing talk. Still today, people say it is a world-changing talk. It has affected the way we live in this world today because of this talk that Jesus gave so long ago. I want to ask you, just in, in thinking about that this morning, to consider your own life. Because isn't it true that whenever you and I discover a competency, whenever we kind of come across that thing in our lives that we're really good at, isn't it so true that what we do with our lives is we try to just keep feeling that in our lives. We try to orientate all of the energy of our lives around those kinds of events so that we can repeat whatever it is that made us feel so good. So we can repeat whatever it is that made us feel so, so kind of you know, important or esteemed. So often in our lives, that's how we live it. And I think that's why you, you, you find business people, that's the thing that energizes them and so they go from business deal to business deal. And you find lawyers and, and they find that, well that's the thing, I'm a, I'm a great lawyer and I'm an important person and so they just go from trial to trial. Or musicians, musicians come along and it's like they go from performance to performance because it's the adulation of the crowd. Or athletes go from game to game, sales people from quota to quota, let me tell you, even pastors who go from sermon to sermon. I want you to think this morning, isn't it so easy for us to fall into a pattern of trying to achieve a little bit more, to push our performance a little bit more, to hit those goals, to achieve the objectives until we become oblivious to everything else and we have little or no capacity to give and receive love from the people who are in and around our lives. I think sometimes a lot of us are far too willing. We're far too willing to trade building loving relationships. We'll rather trade that for the glory of professional success or personal achievement. And it's not that that's wrong, but it's when the balance gets out. It's when the balance is wrong. It's when things get misaligned that the very people, the very lives that God wants you to touch don't get touched. And you miss it because you're distracted. What struck me is that with Jesus, after this amazing public moment, he just kind of, he just goes back to what's important. He, 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 he dedicates his life to getting back to the daily activities of, of living and loving people around his life. The people that he bumps into, that's more important than the next big event. The next big speaking engagement. No, it's the people that he encounters every day. And I'm beginning to understand that for Jesus, those everyday exchanges with soldiers and servant boys and widows and, and prostitutes, let me tell you, for Jesus, those were the big deal. They were the big deal because they were irretrievable opportunities to give and to receive what he called supreme in the entire world, love. Irretrievable opportunities to give and receive love. Love is what affects human hearts. It affects our hearts now, and I tell you, it'll affect your heart forever. And you've got to know this morning that, that God's love is available to anyone who would open up their heart wider to it. But it also enables us to become known as loving men and women. People who don't just talk about God's love, but people who demonstrate it. People who live out love. Can you imagine what would happen in your home or what would happen in this church or what would, what would happen in your workplace or in your school or in the city or in far off places if everyone was filled with an overflowing love, if they were overflowing with God's love and they were saying loving things to each other and doing loving things and offering time and showing acts of kindness and freely entering into the joys and the sorrows of other, other people's lives, can you imagine I'll tell you this morning, if that's ever gonna become a reality, it starts with you. 
And it starts with me, living out love.